Book three, chapter eight of the Wars of the Jews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Wars of the Jews by Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book three, chapter eight. How Josephus was discovered by a woman, and was willing to deliver himself up to the Romans, and what discourse he had with his own men, when they endeavored to hinder him, and what he said to Vespasian, when he was brought to him, and after what manner Vespasian used him afterward. 1. And now the Romans searched for Josephus, both out of the hatred they bore him, and because their general was very desirous to have him taken, for he reckoned that if he were once taken, the greatest part of the war would be over. They then searched among the dead, and looked into the most concealed recesses of the city. But as the city was first taken, he was assisted by a certain supernatural providence. For he withdrew himself from the enemy when he was in the midst of them, and leaped into a certain deep pit, whereto there adjoined a large den at one side of it, which den could not be seen by those that were above ground, and there he met with forty persons of eminency that had concealed themselves, and with provisions enough to satisfy them for not a few days. So in the daytime he hid himself from the enemy, who had seized upon all places, and in the night time he got up out of the den and looked about for some way of escaping, and took exact notice of the watch. But as all places were guarded everywhere on his account, that there was no way of getting off unseen, he went down again into the den. Thus he concealed himself two days, but on the third day, when they had taken a woman who had been with them, he was discovered. Whereupon Vespasian sent immediately and zealously two tribunes, Paulinus and Gallicanus, and ordered them to give Josephus their right hands as a security for his life, and to exhort him to come up. 2. So they came and invited the man to come up, and gave him assurances that his life should be preserved. But they did not prevail with him, for he gathered suspicions from the probability there was that one who had done so many things against the Romans must suffer for it, though not from the mild temper of those that invited him. However, he was afraid that he was invited to come up in order to be punished, until Vespasian sent besides these a third tribune, Nicanor, to him. He was one that was well known to Josephus, and had been his familiar acquaintance in old time. When he was come, he enlarged upon the natural mildness of the Romans, towards those they have once conquered, and told him that he had behaved himself so valiantly, that the commanders rather admired than hated him, that the general was very desirous to have him brought to him, not in order to punish him, for that he could do, though he should not come voluntarily, but that he was determined to preserve a man of his courage. He moreover added this, that Vespasian, had he been resolved to impose upon him, would not have sent to him a friend of his own, nor put the fairest color upon the vilest action, by pretending friendship and meaning perfidiousness, nor would he have himself acquiesced, or come to him, had it been to deceive him. 3. Now as Josephus began to hesitate with himself about Nicanor's proposal, the soldiery were so angry that they ran hastily to set fire to the den, but the tribune would not permit them to do so, as being very desirous to take the man alive. And now, as Nicanor lay hard at Josephus to comply, and he understood how the multitude of the enemies threatened him, he called to mind the dreams which he had dreamed in the night time, whereby God has signified to him beforehand both the future calamities of the Jews, and the events that concern the Roman emperors. Now Josephus was able to give shrewd conjectures about the interpretation of such dreams, as have been ambiguously delivered by God. Moreover, he was not unacquainted with the prophecies contained in the sacred books, as being a priest himself, and of the posterity of priests. And just then he was in an ecstasy, and setting before him the tremendous images of the dreams he had lately had, he put up a secret prayer to God, and said, Since it pleaseth thee, who has created the Jewish nation, to depress the same, and since all their good fortune is gone over to the Romans, and since thou hast made choice of this soul of mine, to foretell what is to come pass hereafter, I willingly give them my hands, and am content to live. And I protest openly that I do not go over to the Romans as a deserter of the Jews, but as a minister from thee. 4. 
When he had said this, he complied with Nicanor's invitation. But when those Jews who had fled with him understood that he yielded to those that invited him to come up, they came about him in a body and cried out, Nay, indeed, now may the laws of our forefathers, which God ordained himself, well grown to purpose. That God we mean who hath created the souls of the Jews of such a temper that they despise death. O oh, Josephus, art thou still fond of life, and canst thou bear to see the light in a state of slavery? How soon hast thou forgotten thyself? How many hast thou persuaded to lose their lives for liberty? Thou hast therefore had a false reputation for manhood, and a like false reputation for wisdom, if thou canst hope for preservation from those against whom thou hast fought so zealously, and art however willing to be preserved by them, if they be in earnest. But although the good fortune of the Romans hath made thee forget thyself, we ought to take care that the glory of our forefathers may not be tarnished. We will lend thee our right hand and sword, and if thou wilt die willingly, thou wilt die as general of the Jews. But if unwillingly, thou wilt die as a traitor to them. As soon as they said this, they began to thrust their swords at him, and threatened they would kill him, if he thought of yielding himself to the Romans. 5. Upon this Josephus was afraid of their attacking him, and yet thought he should be a betrayer of the commands of God, if he died before they were delivered. So he began to talk like a philosopher to them in the distress he was in then, when he said thus to them, O oh, my friends, why are we so earnest to kill ourselves, and why do we set our soul and body, which are such dear companions, at such variance? Can any one pretend that I am not the man I was formerly? Nay, the Romans are sensible how that matter stands well enough. It is a brave thing to die in war, but so that it be according to the law of war, by the hand of conquerors. If, therefore, I avoid death from the sword of the Romans, I am truly worthy to be killed by my own sword, and my own hand. But if they admit of mercy, and would spare their enemy, how much more ought we to have mercy upon ourselves, and to spare ourselves? For it is certainly a foolish thing to do that to ourselves which we quarrel with them for doing to us. I confess freely that it is a brave thing to die for liberty, but still so that it be in war, and done by those who take that liberty from us. But in the present case, our enemies do neither meet us in battle, nor do they kill us. Now he is equally a coward who will not die when he is obliged to die, and he who will die when he is not obliged so to do. What are we afraid of, when we will not go up to the Romans? Is it death? If so, what are we afraid of? When we but suspect our enemies will inflict it on us, shall we inflict it on ourselves for certain? But it may be said we must be slaves. And are we then in a clear state of liberty at present? It may also be said that it is a manly act for one to kill himself. No, certainly, but a most unmanly one. As I should esteem that pilot to be an errant coward, who, out of fear of a storm, should sink his ship of his own accord. Now self-murder is a crime most remote from the common nature of all animals, and an instance of impiety against God our Creator. Nor indeed is there any animal that dies of its own contrivance, or by its own means, for the desire of life is a law engraven in them all. On what account we deem those that openly take it away from us to be our enemies, and those that do it by treachery are punished for so doing. And do not you think that God is very angry when a man does injury to what he hath bestowed on him? For from him it is that we have received our being, and we ought to leave it to his disposal to take that being away from us. The bodies of all men are indeed mortal, and are created out of corruptible matter. But the soul is ever immortal, and is a portion of the divinity that inhabits our bodies. Besides, if any one destroys or abuses a depositum he hath received from a mere man, he is esteemed a wicked and perfidious person. But then, if any one cast out of his body this divine depositum, can we imagine that he who is thereby affronted does not know of it? Moreover, our law justly ordains that slaves which run away from their master shall be punished, though the masters they run away from may have been wicked masters to them. And shall we endeavor to run away from God, who is the best of all masters, and not guilty of impiety? Do not you know that those who depart out of this life according to the law of nature, and pay that debt which was received from God, which he that lent it us, 
is pleased to require it back again enjoy eternal fame that their houses and their posterity are sure that their souls are pure and obedient and obtain a most holy place in heaven for whence in the revolutions of ages they are again sent into pure bodies while the souls of those whose hands have acted madly against themselves are received by the darkest place in hades and while god who is their father punishes those that offend against either of them in their posterity for which reason god hates such doings and the crime is punished by our most wise legislator accordingly our laws determine that the bodies of such as kill themselves should be exposed till the sun be set without burial although at the same time it be allowed by them to be lawful to bury our enemies sooner the laws of other nations also enjoin such men's hands to be cut off when they are dead which have been made use of in destroying themselves when alive while they reckon that as a body is alien from the soul so is the hand alien from the body it is therefore my friends a right thing to reason justly and not add to the calamities which men bring upon us in piety towards our creator if we have a mind to preserve ourselves let us do it for to be preserved by those our enemies to whom we have given so many demonstrations of our courage is no way inglorious but if we have a mind to die it is good to die by the hand of those that have conquered us for nay part i will not run over to our enemies quarters in order to be a traitor to myself for certainly i should then be much more foolish than those that deserted to the enemy since they did it in order to save themselves and i should do it for destruction for my own destruction however i heartily wish the romans may prove treacherous in this matter for if after their offer of their right hand for security i be slain by them i shall die cheerfully and carry away with me the sense of their perfidiousness as a consolation greater than victory itself six now these and many the like motives did josephus use to these men to prevent their murdering themselves but desperation had shut their ears as having long ago devoted themselves to die and they were irritated at josephus they then ran upon him with their swords in their hands one from one quarter and another from another and called him a coward and every one of them appeared openly as if he were ready to smite him but he calling to one of them by name and looking like a general to another and taking a third by the hand and making a fourth ashamed of himself by praying him to forbear and being in this condition distracted with various passions as he well might in the great distress he was then in he kept off every one of their swords from killing him and was forced to do like such wild beasts as are encompassed about on every side who always turn themselves against those that last touch them nay some of their right hands were debilitated by the reverence they bear to their generals in these his fatal calamities and their swords dropped out of their hands and not a few of them there were who when they aimed to smite him with their swords they were not thoroughly either willing or able to do it seven however in this extreme distress he was not destitute of his usual sagacity but trusting himself to the providence of god he put his life into hazard in the following manner and now he said since it is resolved among you that you will die come on let us commit our mutual deaths to determination by lot he whom the lot falls to first let him be killed by him that hath the second lot and thus fortune shall make it progress through us all nor shall any of us perish by his own right hand for it would be unfair if when the rest are gone somebody should repent and save himself this proposal appeared to them to be very just and when he had prevailed with them to determine this matter by lots he drew one of the lots for himself also he who had the first lot laid his neck bare to him that had the next as supposing that the general would die among them immediately for they thought death if josephus might but die with them was sweeter than life yet he was with another left to the last whether we must say it happened so by chance or whether by the providence of god and as he was very desirous neither to be condemned by the lot nor if he had been left to the last to imbrue his right hand in the blood of his countrymen he persuaded him to trust his fidelity to him and to live as well as himself eight thus josephus escaped in the war with the romans and in this his own war with his friends and was led by nicanor to vespasian but now all the romans ran together to see him 
and as the multitude pressed one upon another about their general, there was a tumult of various kind, while some rejoiced that Josephus was taken, and some threatened him, and some crowded to see him very near, but those that were more remote cried out to have this their enemy put to death, while those that were near called to mind the actions he had done, and a deep concern appeared at the change of his fortune. Nor were there any of the Roman commanders, how much soever they had been enraged at him before, but relented when they came to the sight of him. Above all the rest, Titus's own valor, and Josephus's own patience under his afflictions, made him pity him, as did also the commiseration of his age, when he recalled to mind that but a little while ago he was fighting, but lay now in the hands of his enemies, which made him consider the power of fortune, and how quick is the turn of affairs in war, and how no state of men is sure, for which reason he then made a great many more to be of the same pitiful temper with himself, and induced them to commiserate Josephus. He was also of great weight in persuading his father to preserve him. However, Vespasian gave strict orders that he should be kept with great caution, as though he would in a very little time send him to Nero. 9. When Josephus heard him give these orders, he said that he had somewhat in his mind that he would willingly say to himself alone. When, therefore, they were all ordered to withdraw, except Titus and two of his friends, he said, Thou, O Vespasian, thinkest no more than that thou hast taken Josephus himself captive, but I come to thee as a messenger of great tidings. For had not I been sent by God to thee, I knew what was the law of the Jews in this case, and how it becomes generals to die. Dost thou send me to Nero? For why? Are Nero's successors till they come to thee still alive? Thou, O Vespasian, art Caesar and emperor, thou and this thy son. Bind me not still faster, and keep me for thyself, for thou, O Caesar, are not only lord over me, but over the land and the sea, and all mankind, and certainly I deserve to be kept in closer custody than I am now in, in order to be punished, if I rashly affirm anything of God. When he had said this, Vespasian at present did not believe him, but suppose that Josephus said this as a cunning trick, in order to his own preservation, but in a little time he was convinced, and believed what he said to be true, God himself erecting his expectations, so as to think of obtaining the empire, and by other signs foreshowing his advancement. He also found Josephus to have spoken truth on other occasions, for one of those friends that were present at that secret conference said to Josephus, I cannot but wonder how thou couldst not foretell to the people of Jotapata that they should be taken, nor couldst foretell this captivity which hath happened to thyself, unless what thou now sayest be a vain thing, in order to avoid the rage that is risen against thyself. To which Josephus replied, I did foretell to the people of Jotapata that they would be taken on the forty-seventh day, and that I should be caught alive by the Romans. Now, when Vespasian had inquired of the captives privately about these predictions, he found them to be true, and then he began to believe those that concerned himself. Yet did he not set Josephus at liberty from his hands, but bestowed on him suits of clothes and other precious gifts. He treated him also in a very obliging manner, and continued so to do, Titus still joining his interest till the honors that were done him. End of Book 3, Chapter 8